Summary of the Garden Party by Catherine Mansfield In the garden party, a rich New Zealand family with a daughter named Laura throws a garden party at their estate. Laura is a teenager and a member of the Sheridan family. After the first few lines of the story say that the early summer day and family garden couldn't be better, Laura's mother sends Laura, the artistic one, to show four workers where to set up the marquee, which is a large outdoor tent. Laura eats her breakfast outside and is surprised to find four polite, strong men who talk in a way that no one in her social class does, quickly and directly. They talk about where to put the sign, the workers start putting it up, and Laura moans about the ridiculous class differences that keep her from hanging out with extraordinary nice guys like these. When the phone rings, Laura runs inside to answer it. On her way, she quickly sees her dad and her brother Lori. She picks up the phone and asks a family friend to lunch. In the other room, she hears the piano being moved. Sadie, one of the Sheridan's housekeepers, tells Laura that the delivery man from the florist is there. When they meet him at the front door, they see trays and trays of pretty pink canna lilies that Mrs. Sheridan ordered on a whim after seeing them in a store window the day before. Laura is upset that her mother told the kids they would be in charge of the party this year, but Mrs. Sheridan tells her to ignore her. The story jumps to the drawing room, where another Sheridan daughter, Jose, sings the sad song This Life is Weary with a brilliant, dreadfully unsympathetic smile while the third, Meg, plays the piano. Again, Sadie stops the story to tell about a request from another working character, the cook wants the name flags for the sandwiches she made. Mrs. Sheridan hasn't written the names on the flags yet, but she tells Sadie that she has them before telling Laura to write the names. She thinks the kids put the envelope with the guest list in it somewhere else, but she finds it hidden behind the dining room clock. Laura writes the messages on the flags and brings them to the kitchen, where Sadie tells them that the cream puff deliver man from Godbeers has come. The cook tells Laura and Jose to each have a cream puff, but they don't think it's right to eat something sweet so soon after eating breakfast. Laura goes back to the garden, but before she gets there, she runs into Godbeer's man. He is telling the shocked workers that a cart driver named Scott died in an accident that morning. She thinks that it would be rude to keep the party going because Scott lives in a row of rundown houses just downhill from the Sheridan's estate. She tells this to her sister Jose, who thinks Scott is drinking on the job and thinks it's funny that Laura cares about the poor. Then Laura goes to her mother, who doesn't care even less. Once Mrs. Sheridan finds out that the death didn't happen in their yard, she finds Laura's worry funny and annoying. Mrs. Sheridan gives Laura her hat to keep her from thinking about Scott's death. When Laura looks at herself in the mirror in her bedroom, she starts to see Scott's death as fuzzy and fake, like a picture in a newspaper. Laura changes her mind and goes to lunch instead of the party. When Lori gets home from work after lunch, Laura goes to ask him what he thinks about stopping the party. After her brother says nice things about her hat, Laura decides not to talk about the accident and instead goes to the party, which Mansfield tells in less than half a page. When it's over, the Sheridans meet in the balcony, where Mr. Sheridan talks about Scott's accident. Mrs. Sheridan is annoyed that her husband also wants to ruin their fun, so she makes fun of Laura and then has a sudden idea, they should send their extras to the Scots. Even though she thinks this is rude, Laura agrees to take the basket herself. Laura goes down to the cottages, where she is shocked by how ugly the people living there are and embarrassed by how expensive her clothes are. She decides to go back, but then she sees she's already at the Scott house. She knocks and tells M's sister, who answers the door, that she just wants to leave the basket and go. But M's sister still lets her in and shows her to the man's crying widow, M. Scott. Scott thanks Laura for coming but doesn't understand why she would come at all. Laura tries to run out the front door, but instead goes into Scott's room, where his body is covered with a sheet. M's sister pulls down the sheet because she thinks Laura must want to see him. Laura is surprised to find the body calm and beautiful. She thinks the man is dreaming, far away from the crushing rules of society. But she realizes how sad it is that he died and yells forgive my hat before running out of the house and meeting her brother Lori on the road outside. 
He hugs and comforts her as she cries, but he doesn't know that she's crying tears of happiness. Laura starts to tell him what she's learned, but she can't finish. She says, isn't life, and the story ends with the narrator saying that Laurie quite understood and Laurie's completely empty reply, isn't it, darling? About the author. Kathleen Mansfield Beecham was born in New Zealand to a Australian-born English business couple. The Sheridan's house in the Garden Party is based on Mansfield's own childhood home on Tinakori Road in Wellington, which is now a museum in her honor. From the time she was in elementary school, she wanted to be a writer. In 1903, her family sent her and her two sisters to London to study, where she quickly became a good cellist. When she went back to New Zealand in 1906, she quickly grew tired of the endless social events and meaningless courtships her parents expected her to go to. The garden party is most about this time in Mansfield's life, when she was unhappy with her sheltered, privileged upbringing. During this time, she started to write stories and had complicated relationships with an artist named Edith Kathleen Bendel and a Maori woman named Mata Mahupuku, whose trip from Wellington to London and back again was similar to hers and who appears in many of her stories. Mansfield wanted to go back to London and was finally able to do so in 1908. Over the next 10 years, she lived in London and kept in touch with other famous modernists, like Virginia Woolf. After dating her editor, John Middleton Murray, on and off for almost a year, she married him. In 1915, her brother died while training for World War I. This made her want to write more and think more about her life in New Zealand. In 1917, she was told she had cancer, but the time she had left was when she wrote her best work and two collections of short stories. Mansfield's last days were marked by her illness getting worse and her desperate search for a cure, which took her to the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man in France, which was run by George Gurdjieff. She died there at age 34 and is still remembered as one of New Zealand's most famous writers. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.